We do not live in a society anymore that places much value and with some no value on the matter of correct teaching from the Bible concerning about anything. In fact, I would say the appreciation for the Bible is probably at its lowest ebb in this country since it's been in existence. Nevertheless, that doesn't change what the Bible has to say on anything. It doesn't change the fact that the Bible tells us, even as we sang about it a while ago, that Christ uh, is making intercession for us at the right hand of God and never live us so to do. It doesn't change about a judgment day coming at the end of this present age and the end of all material things and time and space. Because whether I believe something or not, if it's the truth, it's just that way. We in the church, whether few in number or large, are what we are because from the heart we've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We understand the place of the Bible in life. And we strive to teach it to others. The same is true when it comes to the church of which we read in the Bible in general and specifically in the New Testament. Even today, most people are what they are religiously because of various things rather than because of what the Bible says. As far as the church is concerned, it would be interesting to do a poll of all the different churches and say, what made you choose this church? And just listen for the answers. Somebody might say, well, it's a rather popular church. Maybe they would say it's a friendly church. Or my mother was a member of that church. Or something to the effect, maybe they got me when I was a, a baby. And I had a choice, but we've always gone, so that's what I'm going to do. Or I married into this church. This was the church of my spouse, and lo, that's how I got involved in it. Or they have the finest building in town. And I don't know what all might be said. Maybe business connections. All of them are wrong reasons if you allow the Bible to tell God or for God in the Bible to tell us the right reason. All I've given you here and many others are worthless as far as God is concerned. They're empty words to a people who wish to be guided by thus, saith the Lord. But I'm telling you today, and I don't need to tell you, you know it, people aren't interested in being guided by thus, saith the Lord. Even their view of the Bible, what it's here for, would be interesting to find out. I just know that more and more people don't pay much attention to it as far as a book of authority. So when it comes to the Lord's church, we must be prepared for that as we seek to take the gospel to a lost world that doesn't care much for anything, if anything, in some places of what the Bible says. But every one of these churches, regardless of how people got to be a part of them, uh, was started by somebody, sometime, at some point. That's just what we would call common sense. If a thing exists and had to start, that's implied. And how many are there in this world today? I remember as a young person, we used to talk about in the United States, there were 350 denominations. I wouldn't even attempt to number the amount of denominations in the United States today. They're everywhere. I've never understood how a person could take Matthew 16, 18 
and just read Christ admitting the Bible is the word of God that Christ said, I will build my church. And think about that for a moment and say, well, is that the church I want to be a part of? Or maybe it would be this way. What church was Paul a member of? Or is it impossible for me to be a member of the church of which Paul was a member? Does that church exist on earth today? Well, let's keep in mind in the parable of the soil, I like to call it. It's called the parable of the sower many times. That the word of God is the seed of the kingdom. Luke 8, 11. To teach the word of God is to sow the seed of the kingdom. Sowing seed is one of the ways that you have planting certain crops. The ground into which the seed goes is going to depend on how well the seed, if it has life in it, the germ of life, is going to do once it sprouts and begins to grow and all of the things involved in such a plant growing to maturity and bearing some sort of fruit. How simple that is. Isn't it amazing that the Lord could explain something as important as the church he would build and yet talk about the word as the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. And that when it's sown in the hearts, taught to people who have good and honest hearts, it brings forth fruit. Therefore, I must say any time I teach... <clears throat> And any time I'm studying for my own benefit, I've got to constantly ask myself the question, am I honest so I can be good? Because that's the kind of disposition of mind that we must have. Or according to Luke 8 in the parable of the soils, Nothing will come of any of it, regardless of the power of the seed. Because the emphasis there is on the kind of mind or heart the seed is sown in, the people that are taught and their attitude about it. So there's where it begins, and if a person doesn't have a right disposition of heart and respect for God's Word as it is in truth, the Word of God, then whatever it teaches is going to mean very little to anybody. And that's pretty much where we are today. It's been working for a long, long time. But the more materialistic and secular we become, the more the ground, the hearts of men were conditioned to reject God and Christ as his son. The Bible is the word of God and, and the church, for that matter, that is described on the pages of the New Testament. But let's assume, and I have to assume something about the audience I speak to every time I speak, because you can't cover everything from the beginning all the time. In every sermon, we never would stop preaching. You'd have 24 hours a day preaching, and that's impossible. I'm assuming this morning that you're here because you have allegiance to God. You're here to engage in the worship of God. Thus you believe in the Bible as the word of God. Thus you're ready to receive whatever the Bible teaches. That you might form your viewpoint of whatever the topic is. And see it as God has revealed it and describes it in the word. So when we speak of the church, and I read something like Matthew 16, 18, Christ saying, as Matthew Van Spurs records it, I will build my church. That would cause me, if I'm interested in the study of the Bible as the word of God, to say, well, what happened to it? Does it still exist? Or maybe, did he get around to building it? Can it be found? Was Peter, Paul, and John, the other apostles, members of it? Luke, uh, 
who traveled as a companion with Paul, the apostle, over much of what he did, who wrote the book of Luke and wrote the book of Acts. Was he a part of the church of which I'm a part of? But seemingly, around about us, people don't ask that question. And I think it's because they just don't see the need in being a part of that particular church that they read of in their own Bibles. And I really don't understand that. I've never understood it all my life. But people who are members of the Lord's Church were either brought up in Christian families, were taught the truth, and at the age of accountability or somewhere in there, obeyed the gospel, and uh, they knew what they were doing. They were added to the Lord's Church. Or else a great many of them in churches that are founded upon the commandments and doctrines of men heard the gospel, were honest with themselves and with the Bible, compared and contrast what they believed with the Bible, and came to understand they weren't a part of the church as it's described in the New Testament. And thus, in learning the gospel and the truth about the church, they obeyed the gospel. Another passage like Matthew 16, 18 is found on the day the Lord's church began in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. People were obedient to the gospel, Acts 2, 37 and 38. Verse 41, and the scripture says the Lord himself added those to the church that were being saved, Acts 2, 47. Is that church still around? Can you find it? It was important to the Lord. He said, I'll build it. And here, evidently he did. He's adding people to it. Well, what allowed them to be added to it? They didn't join anything. It was a passive thing on their part. They were convinced from the preaching of Peter and the other apostles that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Messiah, that he is whom he claimed to be, the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes of the Father but by him. They came to understand that from the preaching of the apostles. And yet the Bible describes them as devout Jews. They weren't hit or miss type Jews. They had made a great deal of alteration in their life to be able to keep the law of Moses and be there on those feast days in Jerusalem for the law required the men to be on three feast, feast days at Jerusalem. Well, they were Jews from Rome. Read the list of the people that were gathered there from Mesopotamia, all sorts of places. So it describes them as devout men. They were doing their best to do what they understood God wanted them to do to be pleasing to him. And they get there and what do they hear? Ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. And they heard all those proofs that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah. Now they're convinced by this preaching. And the miracles done by the apostles proved to them that the word preached by the apostles was from heaven and not from men. But it's the word of God that converted them. And they were pricked in their heart. There we are back to the heart, the inward man, the core of one's being, where thinking takes place, where emotions are found, where the conscience is, where the will is. Not the best way you can describe what a person is. They were honest of heart. We talked about that, didn't we? So that they received the seed of the kingdom in an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 11, and 15. What did it do to them on that day? It pricked them in their heart. It disturbed them. I know how it's disturbed them by the question it moved them to ask. As devout Jews doing their best according to their knowledge at that time of what they ought to do, they came to conclude it wasn't right. It wasn't enough. They were guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. 
And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, the answer came. Peter declared to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all them that be as far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, they're called by the gospel. Jesus already said in the Great Commission in Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why you've got to preach it. Because where the gospel doesn't go, there are no Christians. The gospel is the power of God to save us from sin. Paul said, and he said, I'm not ashamed of it. Romans 1, 16. This was preached for the first time in its fullness on that first Pentecost for the resurrection of Christ. Now, these people that were believers and who were told as believers to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, did they do it? Well, verse 41 says, then they, they gladly received his word. Their gladness was in their heart because they received the answer to their question, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were glad to hear there's a way out of this. God has made a way. So that we sinners, even those who kill the Son of God, can be forgiven. Thus, in they that gladly received his word were baptized. And I take it they were baptized for the reason that the scripture is plain in saying in Acts 2 verse 38. As believers, they repented and were baptized for the remission of sins. Now what did the Lord do with those people? Just say, all right, you're saved. Go out and pick an apostle, and we'll name a church after that apostle, the church of Peter, church of Matthew, church of whoever. And you find the one that suits you the best. They would know what to do if you were to go back to anybody that was a member of the church in the first century that was faithful to God and know what in the world are you talking about. Protestant denominationalism, as we've known it for almost 500 years, didn't come into existence till 1,500 long years after the Lord started his church. Well, the Lord took those people that were obedient to him and added them to the church, Acts 2, 47. Now you say, why did it say that they joined the church? Well, you can certainly join yourself with Christians. But that's not the point. The church is the family of God. 1 Timothy 3.15 The church is the family of God. The household of God. It's also the kingdom of Christ. The church of Christ. The body of Christ. There are various terms given by the Holy Spirit to refer to the body of the saved and its connection with the, the one who saved it. But what do you run into here? Well, you find the Lord adds them to the church. Well, I guess it has to be the one he promised to build. Why would he promise to build one and then go add them to something else? But notice it's an addition because we're born into a family. Every one of us, in most cases, where there's a husband and a wife and a family started, we're born into a family. Even illegitimate children are born into some kind of family. It may not be the family as God would fully have it, but none of us chose the family of which we would be a part. None of us. So that we could say, let's see, I've got a thousand families here. I'm going to study over the next six months and decide which one I want to join. No, when the individual from the heart obeys that form of doctrine which was delivered them, Romans 6, 17 and 18, and is baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, the Lord himself, knowing the hearts of all men thoroughly, knowing why you obeyed the gospel, knowing what your purpose was in it, puts you with others. I have a sister. I was born in my family. I'm the oldest. Well, then mom and daddy had this daughter. And she was added to the family. So it was with you. It's a passive thing on our part. 
we hear and understand and from the heart obey the gospel of Christ in being baptized to Christ. But it's the Lord knowing the hearts of all men that puts you with every one of his children because he knows their hearts too. Now what do those children do? Well, when you begin to study throughout the New Testament of Christ about the church of Christ, as that term's defined and used in the New Testament, we find the organization of it. We find the way that God wants his children to worship him. And we see that the church is charged with taking this same seed of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ, and carrying it to every creature. So they'll have the opportunity to become Christians. Now let me pause here and say this much. Do you not see how simple New Testament Christianity actually is? How it fits in to just about anywhere? And yet when you look around at various churches, and some more than others, of course, they don't even believe that you have to follow the teaching of the New Testament because it's authoritative word of God to be what God wants you to be. Well, they got all kinds of ecclesiasticisms, hierarchies, and all sorts of whatever. You almost have to go to school to get a degree in understanding how the whole thing works. Not so with the Lord. He's interested in the heart. Remember when David was selected, and out of all of Jesse's children, Jesse brought up all these other boys. Samuel looked at all of them, and none of them was to be king. And then he said, well, I got this young fellow out there. It didn't even dawn on Jesse that that son was the one that could be king. But David was the one because then he taught God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks at the inward man the heart, the mind, the core of one's being. And he said of David, I have found a man after my own heart. And the gospel is designed to reach out there and find those people. Brethren, that's one reason we don't water it down. If you add to it, take from it, or in some way alter it, you're going to have people coming into the church that shouldn't. How are you going to have people kept out that should? The purity of the gospel is directly connected to the purity of the church. The purity of the doctrine that guides how the church is to be, individual Christians, or the organization work and worship of the church is going to be determined by just how much the members of it really care to keep the purity of the doctrine on Christian conduct and worship and so forth clear. They must be studying. They must be examining. So we're taught to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith unless we be reprobate. So I'm interested in doctrine. Another reason I'm interested in doctrine is because of what's said about it throughout the New Testament. The importance is placed upon doctrine. All it means is teaching. I want to be sure I'm interested in the doctrine of Christ. John tells us, 2 John, that if we don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, we don't have God. Is that language hard to understand? If we don't abide in the teachings of Christ, we do not have God. But now if you abide in the teachings of Christ, and John wrote this to people who already heard the gospel and obeyed it and were members of the church. But if we abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have both the Father and the Son. Now what attitude, what mindset, what actions should we take toward those who teach a perverted gospel? However it's perverted. Whatever's been added to it or taken away from it or altered some way. Well, John also tells us that. When he makes it clear that if you you don't abide the doctrine of Christ, you don't have God. And they're true to have not a thing in the world to do with the person who teaches contrary to the gospel of Christ. Do not bid him Godspeed. Do not in any form or fashion encourage him 
in the era he teaches. Look at Paul's attitude in Galatians 1. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. American Standard says anathema. That's the Greek word. And it means literally cut off from God. How does the Father think about people who teach contrary to the doctrine? That will be cut off from God. God doesn't want his children, the church, to be polluted. Now, show you how people are. Those of you who are mothers and daddies and have your children still at home, or maybe they're not, but at least they're still, let's say at this time, under your jurisdiction. Do you care what they eat? If you see your two-year-old with a bottle that has a skull and crossbones on it, and he's trying his best to get the lid off of it and gnawing on it, does that cause you any concern? Well, what about God and his attitude toward his family that cost him the life of his own son, that he died an ignominious death on the cross of pain and agony and shame to bring the church into existence? Acts 20 and 28 tells us it was with his blood that he purchased the church. How much does the church mean to God? Or we may just say, how much does the church mean to Jesus? Is it worth the purchase price? People who say the church has nothing to do with our salvation, says Christ is messed up bad because he bought this church that he promised to build with his own blood shed on Calvary's cross. Surely the church that Jesus built is worth the purchase price. So to be mean, the Lord's church I'm not talking about churches founded and sustained such as they can be on the commandments and doctrines of men. I'm talking about the one you read about in your own Bible. It's there. You got a Bible, a reputable translation. All these things are there. They're there to enlighten us. Not only teach us exactly what we must believe and do to be saved, but what God does with the saved and how the saved are to act in the church that Jesus built. So I'm concerned about all that. Jesus is described to be the head of the church. We may have said more about that later. But Jesus is not the head of man-made churches. And Jesus in his earthly ministry made it very clear that in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Well, the context literally had to do with the Jews violating the law of Moses, but the principle has followed through from the patriarchal age to the mosaical age to the Christian age. Vain means it's empty or worthless. It's a worthless thing with God to teach the commandments and doctrines of men. Whether it's having to do with our worship of God, our service to God, or anything else pertaining to Christianity. So why shouldn't I be concerned about who built the church of which I am a member? Or am I a member of the church that Jesus promised to build, Acts 2 he did build, to which he adds the saved and he purchased with his blood? I want to be a member of that church. I'm as thankful as I can be. And the older I get, the more I appreciate kind of preaching that I grew up under. Some of the preachers, if any of them, were very well known in the sense of throughout the whole of the brotherhood, the way things were many, many years ago. But they knew the truth on the plan of salvation and the Lord's church and its worship organization, its work, individual Christian living. And I heard the truth preached. Now, there were times, probably as a young person, I was concentrating on something else and whatever else that I shouldn't have been. We're not talking about what I should have been doing. We're talking about what came out of that pulpit and was made available to the person that wanted to know. I learned a long time ago that when you're teaching, as well as anybody could teach the truth from a pulpit or a podium in a classroom, people may not listen to you. But that's their problem, not yours. They did the Lord the same way. They didn't listen to him. A lot of folks did, a lot of folks didn't. 
That moves me no little. You know, I can preach to two or three people just as well as I can preach to a thousand. It doesn't make any difference. I remember when we had a radio program years ago in Van Buren, Arkansas. I was talking with some preachers, I think it's some lectureship, I don't remember, a long time ago now, nearly 50 years ago. And they had a hard time of sitting down when you did a live program or even recording one at a microphone and preaching. Because there wasn't anybody out there. This radio station where we preached, uh, it was a daily program, 1130 to 1145, Monday through Friday. Why, it was just the announcer, and the one who was the engineer and everything else over there, and a glass between us, like this glass petition here. And I was sitting in a little room about the size of one of these classrooms, and a table and a microphone. But in my mind, I knew that signal was going out to thousands and thousands of people. And I could preach just as hard that way, if you will call it hard, just as intense as I can to you or whether it was one person. I've never understood why it takes a thousand people before a person can preach. Well, we would all like to see a thousand people in one particular place all the time running the church buildings over to hear it. But the thing of it is, our interest should be in knowing the truth about all things religious when it comes to salvation, what the Bible has to say about it, and ready to teach at the drop of a hat. As I used to say, I'll drop the hat. <laughs> are, are you ready to preach? Are you ready to teach as a member of the church the truth of God on the church? Are you ready to ask somebody, what do you know about the church? Remember Christ asked the Jews one time, whose son is the Christ? Well, he knew. Why did he ask them? To engender thought. And to see what they would say. I suggest one reason that we do not in this very loose age. Where there's much disrespect for the Bible as the word of God. Much disrespect for doctrine. Doctrine of Christ. The importance of it. Or the existence of God or the deity of Christ. That we need to be saying to people things that cause them to maybe take a step back. And be willing then to receive whatever comes our way, but be prepared to teach them when they come back with an answer. Would, what would you do if people were walking around asking you that question? You know, people slam the door in Jehovah's Witnesses' face. Man, I, I'm happy when they come to my door. I'm just so happy for them to come in and sit down because we're going to have a good time and they're going to hear things they never heard of before in their life and they're not going to be able to answer them with their doctrine, not consistently. Same thing's true of the Mormons. Let them come. I wish they had somebody coming to the house every day, all day long to hear those things. But brethren, I hate to say it, the very people of God in this church of which I'm talking about today just don't think that way. They're not evangelistic. I hear that word a lot. It's a good one. When they see somebody, it never dawns on them. That person's headed straight to judgment and is unprepared. What can I try to do to get some sort of uh, study out of it? In England one time, we were knocking doors. This was, I ah, must have been back about 1990, somewhere back then. And we were handing out pamphlets about the congregation with some uh, in, invitation to take a Bible correspondence course, which we wouldn't have mentioned to them or even have a personal Bible study. And that's been done by many, many people. But this one will always stand out in my mind, and probably I've told it to some of you. We came to this door, and there was an English brother with me. Knocked on the door, and I could hear the fellow come through the house. And he was da 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 up da 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 and he'd get closer and closer to the door. And he opened the door, and I made my spiel as nice as I knew how. And he stood there patiently smiling and listening to me. And when I finished my spiel, he said, you're through, and slammed the door. And I heard him go back through the house, up da 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 But now it's on him 
The opportunity was given to him personally to study the Bible, and he said no. Rather, our evangelistic disposition of heart and caring for the souls of people that like God says the Lord's church should means that we at least give the opportunity for people to say no. But I promise you, if we're consistent with it, whatever it is, whether it's knocking doors or not, that's not the point. However we can make contact, then we do it. We say things. We ask questions. Now, we started in Matthew 16, 18, basically. Do you remember how that conversation in Caesarea Philippi started? It started with the Lord asking his disciples a question. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He got the ball rolling among his own disciples. If we wait on people who are not members of the church in this loose age that has no respect for God and Christ and the Bible, have no desire about doctrine, if we let them continue on because we don't want to say anything, then we can expect things to happen that aren't good. How, why, why should the world want to persecute the Lord's church the way it was persecuted in the first century? It, it has no reason to. We're not causing any stir. We don't set up, upset anybody hardly. We don't take out newspaper ads and say the things that are glaringly contrary to the state of this society and to the denominational churches. We don't do anything but try to figure out how can we be nice and not hurt somebody's feeling. I'll say it again. I've said it the last several weeks off and on. Harmlessness does not equate with holiness. When Peter announced to those people on the day of Pentecost, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God, the Bible has just called those people devout. So what does that mean? Peter and the other apostles were standing up and speaking to devout, sincere Jews. Ye have taken and with wicked hands. Devout people have wicked hands. Ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified the Son of God. We will understand more about what New Testament Christianity is and how we spread the gospel and the importance of doctrine and how we get people to study and even giving them the opportunity at times to slam the door in our face and say you're through if we'll just look at how Jesus operated as the master teacher and how the apostles operated. Someone has said, and it's a very trite old saying concerning the apostles and their work, wherever Paul went, there was either revival or revolution. You just read about him. Paul went places, and because he taught the truth and lived the truth before them and contended for the faith, he upset the whole apple cart. Let's face it, brethren. We don't like to be not liked. Maybe I should say unliked. We want everybody to like us. I don't think they were liking the Son of God who never did anything wrong, who never sinned, and they nailed him to the tree. They nailed him to the tree because he was sinless. He was perfect. He was God in the flesh. And he was there to save them. If you need to obey the gospel this morning, we urge you to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him and be buried with the Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to his church, and there you can live and worship until time's no more for you, and then go home and be with the Lord. As a child of God, if you've sinned, you need to repent, confess those sins, and pray for forgiveness. Whatever you need in those areas, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.